Good morning. My name is Bill Wolverton. I'm your service leader this morning. Whatever your ethnicity, theological belief, gender, sexual orientation, age, and anything else that makes you who you are, please know that you are warmly welcome in our community. If this is your first time with us, a very special welcome to you. We are a diverse community and our Sunday services are unique each week. We encourage you to try us out a couple of times to get a taste of the variety. And we'd love to welcome you to the community, so please consider sharing your contact information with us. We have a wonderful website, ufon.ca, and invite you to check it out for more detailed information about who we are, the services we offer, and how you can connect with us. We acknowledge today that we meet on the unceded traditional territory of the Shunamic First Nation. As Unitarians, we are committed to the work of reconciliation required to address the harm done to all Indigenous peoples and their cultures by non-Indigenous peoples. We have much to learn from the Indigenous perspective that the earth is the source of all life and that our responsibility is to honor and care for it. Uh, before you begin, let me remind you to turn off, mute, or put your cell phones on vibrate. It's time for today's announcements. We thank Brenda Stewart for the lovely flowers on the screen this morning. Um, we have a special general meeting on April 24th at noon, immediately after the Sunday service. The main purpose of the meeting is to set in motion the search for a new minister. I remind you that we record these services. For privacy reasons, the joys and concerns are edited out before the service is uploaded to the website. And when there is a children's story, that can also be edited out for, for copyright reasons. All of our services can be found on our website. To find out about all special events, groups, and meetings taking place in the fellowship, either go to the calendar on our website or read the update date on our, uh, the weekly update email sent to you on Thursdays. I, I have the pleasure of welcoming back our guest speaker, Jackie Hildering, whose presentation is entitled Bull Kelp, The Dance Below the Waves. In addition to being a humpback whale researcher with the Marine Education and Research Society, Jackie is an underwater photographer and educator who goes by the Marine Detective. On-camera experience includes work with PBS, the BBC, and Animal Planet. Let us now into sac uh, sacred time. Patrick will lead us into worship through music. All right, good morning all. Hope you're, uh, hope you're ready. ready for a big uplifting song. So here we go, this is number 1074 in our blue song books. Uh, Turn the world around. Thank you to the slide sharers for the lyrics. <laughs> We come from the fire, living in the fire, go back to the fire, turn the world around. We come from the water, living on the water, go back to the water, turn the world around. We come from the mountain, living on the mountain, go back to the mountain, turn the world around. Oh, so is life. Water 
Make the river, river wash the mountain fire. Make the sunlight turn the world around. Heart is of the river, body is the mountain. Spirit is the sunlight turn the world around. We are of the spirit, truly of the spirit. Only can the spirit turn the world around. Oh, so is life, buddy. began by our curiosities, strengthen our wills, and sustain our courage as we seek what is good in and around us. The rhythm of waves beats in the sea like a pulse in living flesh. It is pure force, forever embodying itself in a succession of watery shapes which vanish in its passing. These prophetic thoughts were written by author and naturalist Henry Beston in his published book, The Outermost House. Spiritually shaken by his experiences of World War I in search of peace and solitude, Beston retreated to a small cottage on Cape Cod, located on one of the easternmost reaches of land in the U.S., hence the title, The Outermost House. He had originally planned to spend just two weeks in the seaside cottage, but was so possessed, uh, possessed by the mysterious beauty of his surroundings that he found he could not go. Instead, he stayed to capture in words the wonders of the magical landscape he found himself enthralled by. The migration of the seabirds, the rhythms of the tide, the wind-blown dunes, and the scatter of stars in the changing sky. A chronicle of a solitary 1928 year spent on the dunes of Cape Cod Beach, Beston wrote The Outermost House. It has long been recognized as a classic of American nature writing and in 1964, the cottage was named a National Literary Landmark. Beston died in 1968. In 1978, the little house was carried away by extreme high tides during a winter hurricane. Thousands have come to the beach, wanting to learn more about this man who retreated to the outer beach in a search for the great truth and found it in the spirit of man. In the following excerpt, Beston captures the elemental fascination of ocean waves. I stand on my dune top watching a great wave coursing in from the sea and know I'm watching an illusion that the distant water has not lost its place in the ocean to advance upon me, but only a force shaped in water, a bodiless pulse beat, a vibration. Consider the marvel of what we see Somewhere in the ocean, perhaps a thousand miles and more from this beach, the pulse beat of Earth liberates a vibration, an ocean wave. Is the original force circular, I wonder? And do the ocean waves ring out from the created beat as they do on a quiet surface broken by a stone? Are there perhaps ocean circles so great and so intricate that they are unperceived? Once created, the wave 
where the arc of the wave begins its journey through the sea. Countless vibrations precede it. Countless vibrations follow after. It approaches the continent, swings into the coastline, courses ashore, breaks, dissolves, and is gone. The innermost waters at last flow back in marbly foam to become body to another beat and to be again flung down. So it goes night and day and will go until the secret heart of earth strikes out at last, its last slow beat and the last wave dissolves upon the last forsaken shore. Here's a wonderful song written by uh, the Unitarian Fellowship's previous musical director, Leah Hokanson. It's called The Sound of the Ocean. I'll play it through once so we can all familiarize ourselves again with it, and then we'll sing it three times together. Thank you again to the uh, slide sharers for the lyrics. <laughs> Listening to the sound of the ocean, to the motion of the sea. I'm listening to the sound of the ocean, and the music is healing me. An ever changing chorus. I'm listening to the sound of the ocean, and the music is healing me. I'm listening to the sound of the ocean, to the motion of the sea. I'm listening to the sound of the ocean, and the music is healing me. An ever-changing chorus of primal frequency. I'm listening to the sound of the ocean, and the music is healing me. I'm listening to the sound of the ocean, to the motion of the sea. I'm listening to the sound of the ocean, and the music is healing me. An ever-changing chorus of primal frequency. I'm listening to the sound of the ocean, and the music is healing me.
As our thoughts quiet, let the words of author and poet Maury Schwartz settle into our calmness of self. Maury tells the story, you're part of the ocean. The story is about a little wave bobbing along in the ocean, having a grand old time. He's enjoying the wind and the fresh air until he notices the other waves in front of him crashing against the shore. My God, this is terrible, the wave says. Look what's going to happen to me. Then along comes another wave. It sees the first wave looking grim. And it says to him, why do you look so sad? The first wave says, you don't understand. We're all going to crash. All of us waves are going to be nothing. Isn't it terrible? The second wave says, no, you don't understand. You're not a wave. You're part of the ocean. Would you now please join me in singing number 329 in our Gray Songbook. Life has loveliness to sell. to sell a beautiful and splendid things blue waves whitened on a cliff soaring fire that sways and sings and children's faces looking up holding wonder like a Life has loveliness to sell As music like a curve of gold Scent of pine trees in the rain Eyes that love you, arms that hold And for your spirit still delight Holy thoughts that star the night Spend all you have for loveliness To buy and never count the cost For one singing hour of peace Out a year of strife well lost and for a breath of ecstasy, give all you have been or could be. Uh, my deep apologies for being cueless. Um, <laughs> You've seen these sheets, haven't you? Where even like, come in, Jackie, after the fade, apologies. Um, dear folks, thank you so much that I can be back. I'm deeply moved by the words that have already been said. 
apologies specifically to you, Bill. Um, and I believe my head can be seen as well here as I stand up on the stand. Uh, thrilled to be here, uh, have had the joy previously with some of you talking about humpbacks, talking about sea slugs. I was excited then already because I think it's the only church ever in the entire history of humanity that has had sea slugs discussed. You are my people. You are my tribe. So thank you so incredibly much for that. Um, and indeed already said I wear two hats here. I am a humpback researcher with the Marine Education Research Society where it's the humpbacks as an ambassador for our waters and dealing with the reality of um, boaters who don't do what they're supposed to do and conservation in the big picture. And then I love to hurl myself underwater where I would normally be on a day like today. And it seems like things aren't advancing. There we go. And wear a green tutu and go underwater and take pictures of sea slugs and show people why we have giant whales in our waters. So that is who I am. Um, and today I get to talk about kelp. And I could never have anticipated because my history is I'm an escape biology teacher from the Netherlands. I came from BC originally, very often went through Nanaimo as a kid because we lived Lady Smith and Shimanus. And went to teach in the Netherlands and then had a, an event in Telegraph Cove where friends had taken me out whale watching. And it was like I was slapped upside the head, realizing I wasn't learning from nature anymore. I was talking about it as, as if it were somewhere else. So that set me on a path of that's all I wanted was I just wanted to be learning from nature and I wanted it to count because through and through I'm a teacher. And for me, ultimately, it's about the welfare of children beyond all things. But somebody gave me an underwater camera after I only started diving some 20 years ago, and I didn't want it. I was already taking pictures at the surface, and it was all consuming. But what I learned is by showing people what was under the surface, and oh, the metaphors the ocean gives, doesn't it? That it was incredibly powerful that I started working in a currency of getting people to say, that's here. It's like, yeah, that's here. It's the dark waters that have more life in them because it's a soup of plankton, plant-like and animal-like. But this is what people see at the surface. So I literally, yeah, was called upon to take people deeper. And this is the world that I love to be in. And there is no happier place for me than being in a kelp forest. And, and again, all the metaphors, right? Being part of the flow, yeah, the depth, going below the surface, all of that. But for me, that is my church, is the kelp forest. And again, trying to make it count. The importance of kelp forest, you're probably well aware, they photosynthesize. So hence, they're essential. But thank goodness we're really concerned about plants on land, but don't realize that the ocean's algae from the microscopic that make the ocean look green to our giants in the forest they're producing 50% at least of your oxygen, no matter if you live in a desert. Not very helpful that there's ignorance about that, is there? Because we have the tendency to perceive a divide between land and sea, and we use the ocean literally to flush away so much of our poor choices. So there's oxygen production, and then imagine the amount of carbon dioxide buffering that happens as a result of photosynthesis as well. Incredibly important because they're food from the microscopic to the giants. Food for the tiny little larva feeding on the tiny little algae in the ocean, the soup of these dark waters, but also for bigger animals like urchins who are mowing down on some kelp here. And I will come back to that. Their habitat, just look, it's a forest for all kinds of juvenile rockfish, juvenile salmon, herring, there are so many species that love to live in the forest. So you have a kelp crab there. They are like acrobats holding onto the kelp. They're designed because of course I get to look at perfection. So do you when you go into nature. Things that have lived longer than we humans have and with, have withstood the test of time in being perfection, whether that's evolution or creation, I don't care. But yeah, the kelp crabs can snag things as they go by. They can hang on the kelp and go back and forth. And then this beautiful, beautiful alabaster nudibranch, one of the many sea slugs, they're right below the surface, as you can see with the sun coming down. And yet the average person doesn't know they exist. You have a juvenile baby giant octopus 
using kelp as a hammock right beside hooded nudibranchs. Yeah, so a forest full and full of life. There's also all kinds of human uses for the ocean's algae. Yeah, not just food, but it's used as a thickening agent, even in things like ice cream. There's all kinds of uh, uses with regards to medicinal purposes for humans, cosmetics. Lancome uses the kelp from our ocean. I don't know if that's a good place to displace our kelp, but there you go. And even dentistry and prosthetics. But way more importantly, Ripple the humpback likes kelp. Yeah, <laughs> so it's here you have her rolling around the kelp. Do they like it because it goes over their backs? There's so many yeah, marine mammals that do this. Did you know? Yeah, so whatever that aesthetic is, baby sea otters, like of course otters are the, the custodians of kelp forests by eating the urchins, but also their babies are so buoyant. Yeah, imagine being a sea otter mom trying to take care of your baby and you have to fuel your furnace because you're nursing and you don't have blubber, even though you've got this dense fur. So down you have to go, babies at the surface, no! Yeah, even though nature has given an incredibly thick fur, the kelp gets used to wrap the baby to anchor it. There is perfection for you. There is connectedness. This I'll never forget, this specific harbor seal. We don't target marine mammals underwater, thankfully it's illegal, but occasionally seals and sea lions find us. So I'd actually put my camera away. We were on our safety stop the last three minutes of the dive. And I see that there's a, this seal is corkscrewing itself in the kelp wrapping it around the long part of the kelp and unrolling and rolling. And it's like, I am amongst the people who have judged you for just being like a, a thing on a rock. You're incredibly intelligent, you're astounding. Sometimes we find them sleeping underwater. Yeah, they shut off half their brain and then the other. So that's going on below the surface. Blue herons like to stand on kelp, as you may know. Kelp highways, helped guide First Nations along our coast because they were so dense. And they indicate to you in the case of bull kelp that the depth is about 35 meters. So they are a navigational aid as well. And they're incredibly strong. So this is my dear friend, good Jackie. I'm bad Jackie, we dive together. I don't know why I have to be the bad one, but at any rate, yeah, here we often, there's the idea that the kelp can tangle you up. Sure, if you're a bad diver, it can. But it's so strong, it more often offers a support yeah, that we can hold on to it. Yeah, how can it possibly be so strong? Well, it's got holdfasts, which you see on the right. But important in understanding kelp, certainly the giants, is that they are not plants. They photosynthesize like plants do, but they actually are in a completely different kingdom. They're protists, and I'm not going to go into that boringness, but they aren't plants. They don't have roots. And as a result, they also have different names for their structures. So the long part is not the stem, but the stipe. And in the bull kelp, that's all hollow, the whole thing. Of course, the beauty of design, if you're a kelp, you gotta get to the sun because you have to photosynthesize. So something's gotta hold you up there. It's the bladder or other complicated names for it, like the nematocyst. The leaf-like structures are fronds or blades. And then here is the holdfast. So they're not rooted. What the heck would they root into? That's not how they're getting their nutrients. So you've got these incredible tangled bits. You may have seen them on the beach and now you know what they are. And even on the beach, they're full of life, you'll see. You get a sense of just how important the habitat, even just of the holdfast is. But they're holding on. And therefore, if there's small rocks at the bottom and they hold on, they're actually carrying them away. So they're changing the ocean bottom in that regard, all the balance between buoyancy and anchoring. I've made it sound like it's just all bull kelp up to this point. Yeah, just talking about it generically. We actually have two species of kelp forest uh, in British Columbia. On the left, you have the bull kelp, and you'll see there's one stipe, one bladder. And if you look on the right, you have giant kelp where there are offshoots and you've got multiple bladders. Bull kelp grows up to 17 centimeters a day, racing up to the sun, and giant kelp grows even faster. Bull kelp is an annual. So I'm the marine detective. Where on earth does the kelp go? The bull kelp specifically in the winter, you see a few dark green tattered bits that are really broken down at the surface. 
And then yet, now in the spring, up comes the beautiful bright green baby kelp. How is that possible? There are no seeds buried in the bottom of the ocean. So how that mystery gets solved, get ready. Here's a difficult, difficult graphic coming up, sorry. So what is happening is that here you can see there are patches. Do you see that? You can see it even better here. Those drop to the bottom of the ocean. They have spores in them. So look at how tattered the winter kelp is there. And you can actually see where the perforated bits are, where the spores have gone to the bottom of the ocean. Those spores, here they are magnified a hundred times. Then what they do is this. So the long part of bull kelp is asexually reproducing. It drops those spore patches down to the bottom of the ocean. They actually turn into males and females that create a completely different version of bull kelp. And this is true for all the algae and for a lot of mosses. It's alternation of generations. So the parent looks nothing like its offspring. Its offspring look nothing like the parent. This isn't a life cycle. This is two completely different versions of the same species. So at the bottom of the ocean, these spores have ensured there are male and female gametes, sex cells, that will come together and not create something that looks like them, but that giant version. That's what's going on right now within the ocean, and it's freaking amazing that nature would do something like this. So now you are amongst the very few people on the planet that when you see this, you can go, spore patch, I know what that is. It's all about having the knowledge. Uh, important other life question, big mystery. As you might have heard naturalists, it is a very common thing that if you go out with a kayak or whatever, they'll say there's enough carbon monoxide in that bull kelp to kill a chicken. So being me and having oceans of time on my hands, absolutely not. I decided to dedicate a Sunday to finding out if this was actually true. I cannot tell you how weird it got trying to figure this out and even it even involves an elephant named Bo who lived in Alaska. Yeah, look, I'm not going to go there because it's too complicated, but there is carbon monoxide instead of dioxide as a product of byproduct of photosynthesis. The whole hollow stipe and the bladder is full of it. Back in 1917, there was somebody who used lethal methods who actually like broke open the kelp, took various animals and expose them to it in a closed container to the carbon monoxide and yep, enough to kill a chicken. True story. But then what did I find out? With non-lethal methods, thank God, a woman did not kill a man to figure this out, even though there's lots of reasons to do that. No, there isn't. Anyway, so <laughs> I said that in a church. I don't know where I'm going in the next life. At any rate, yeah, what, what she did is did the math. Yeah, so it then figured out that indeed it's not just enough to kill a chicken. There's a car enough carbon monoxide in the bigger bull kelps to actually take out an average sized man in a closed environment. So there you go. Talk about knowledge nobody else has. Now you know this. But here we go. There are also concerns. You knew this was coming. If you've seen my other presentation, you've already know about sunflower uh, star uh, sea star wasting disease. So the climate is changing, and another reason not to burden you further but this is another symptom of the same disease through a change in climate like of course kelp needs to have the conditions that kelp needs to have in terms of temperature wave action wind all these things so not only is it that directly impacting the kelp but it is still not known what is causing sea star wasting disease whether it's a virus or a bacteria but it does appear that climate change is making sea stars more susceptible to whatever the pathogen is and oh how we can understand that now I think right so world's biggest sea star species they're the worst impacted they've been recognized internationally now as being endangered and we're part of trying to get them recognized in Canada because even though they're recognized internationally they have to be recognized under Canada's species at risk act before there is any action how does this relate to kelp because sunflower stars eat urchins and so if they're eating the urchins, the urchins, and there's less uh, sunflower stars, you've got more urchins, and it's the exact same with the housekeeping of sea otters. You end up having more urchins grazing on kelp. But sea star wasting disease then, this is, video has been sped up. 
Sea stars are not supposed to contort like this. They end up decaying. It's normal that they shed their arms, but they never get a chance to regenerate them and they die. And we see these waves now of juveniles and then they disappear. It's believed that in cold water reservoirs, there's probably more of them, but it is a huge concern, but it's happening below the surface. So the average person doesn't know what's happening. So urchins aren't bad. They're being made out to be the problem in the media, like zombie urchins, like no, urchins are urchins. They're doing what urchins are supposed to do. They're not the bad guys here. It's how we impact things and how we don't understand connectedness and, and, and. But their job, and this has been sped up as well, is that they graze on algae. So then you, as already mentioned, yeah, with that happening, things get thrown out of balance where you don't have the forest, you have the urchin barren as it is referenced. At any rate, folks, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. It is truly soul filling, I find, to come here uh, and to be able to see the concern and care and, and reflected so much of what I believe in. So thank you so much for your support as well. The Greening Tree Project is your opportunity to tell us your stories about what you have done that might be called climate action. Anything counts as long as it is recent. The stories can be about a minute long. We can do a couple of people a week and you are encouraged to do more than one story over the course of the year. Does anyone wish to tell their story today? Please raise your electronic hand on Zoom or come to the mic near the tree. Hi, I'm Brian, and uh, Francis Deverell, uh, whom you all know, and Shelley Sherabin, who is not yet a Unitarian, and myself, have been working on a presentation to uh, Nan Nanaimo City Council's advocacy. Uh, it's a complicated bylaw, but basically we're trying to get new residential buildings in Nanaimo not to have natural gas hookups and preferably use um, heat pumps, which would go a long way to reducing our emissions over the next, because once you build a house with natural gas in it, it puts it out for 20 to 40 years. So we're making progress, which you might have seen in the Nanaimo News Bulletin. Um, the, the vote is coming up shortly. Uh, we might ask for help on that when we get there, but uh, that was my leaf for the week. Very well, uh, you might feel like your leaf is just a tiny flutter in the wind, but it will help strengthen our tree and our tree will help build a forest towards a just safe world for all. Now that we are both online and in the hall, we welcome your donations and pledges in three different ways. First, we have set up the Unitarian Fellowship Bank account to automatically deposit e-transfers sent to info at ufon.ca. Second, you can write a check and pop it in the mail. Third, if you're in the hall, there is a basket at the back of the room where you can place your donation after the service. Our charity for April through June is Eco Justice Canada. If you would like to donate to the designated charity for the month, please note that on your e-transfer or check. We are grateful for your offering. We are nearing the end of our service. After we sing Carry the Flame, you will have the opportunity to stay in the hall to talk with Jackie and to ask any questions you might have about her presentation. There are also breakout rooms available both online and in the hall for the next 30 minutes for those of you who do not wish to participate in the post-service discussion. For those wanting to join, um, Yes, the discussion, please stay where you are. And please help yourself to coffee and snacks which are available at the back of the hall.
Thank you for your participation today. Our closing words are by Sarah Kay, an American poet. There is nothing more beautiful than the way the ocean refuses to stop kissing the shoreline, no matter how many times it's sent away. We extinguish this chalice, this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Then we shall see a world of light and a world of joy. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again.